ancient echoes of the Old Testament, he was the promised Emmanuel, the hope woven into all prophetic whispers. The countless names by which he's known became a symphony across generations. From the pen of Moses, David, Daniel, Isaiah, and beyond, the attributes of who he is echoed through time. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the one whom the government rests upon his shoulders, the very shoulders that would bear the weight of our sorrows. As time unfurled, the New Testament finally revealed the incarnate Son of God himself, the Christ, the physical embodiment of God's grace, power, and salvation. With his divinity and humanity intricately woven, all of creation led to the crescendo of Bethlehem's night. The Savior's name resonated through the darkness. Jesus, the newborn King. In that divine cradle, all the names of old converged into a singular proclamation, a celestial harmony heralding the arrival of perfect love, amazing grace and everlasting life, truly news of great joy, a divine proclamation in a humble manger with the name above every name. Spark, I call you healer. As you commit any broken heart, I call you faithful father. You finish everything you start. My soul was made to respond. I know you by a thousand days, and you deserve every single one. To be amazed at what you've done And I am lost in wonder At all you do I know you by a thousand names And I'll sing them back to you, yeah I'll sing them all back Your love is boundless Beyond You're never giving up on me I call you bondage breaker Cause you read it out the prison keys of my soul You deserve every single one You've given 
Christmas, everybody. Luke chapter 2 says this, And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. That's who we celebrate and acknowledge this morning. Amen. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive. Amen, amen. A lot of joy in this room today, celebrating the birth of our Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. In this room, across the street, around the world, all over the world today, people are celebrating the birth 
of our Savior, Jesus, and we are excited that you are here, glad to celebrate with you today. You should have received a candle as you walked in. Everybody get a candle. Don't light them yet. Don't hold them up yet. We're going to give you all the instructions there toward the end of the service. It's going to be a beautiful time together, but hold on to that, and we'll, we'll light those together in just a few moments. But a lot of guests with us today, a lot of people watching online from around the world here in the country. Would you welcome everybody that's visiting today? Well, if you're new with us, we are so glad that you're here. If you have questions about grace or maybe looking for a new church, I invite you to take out your phone, scan that little QR code on the back of the seat in front of you, and or head out to the Connect page, head out to the Connect Center and see some from our uh, Connect team out there. They'd love to help you answer any questions that you might have about Grace Church, how you can find your way into this wonderful congregation. Glad that you are here today. Uh, in fact, take that little QR code. Once you've scanned it, take it out to the Connect Center. We've got a special gift for you, all right? So meet us out there as soon as this service is over. And make sure to come back next week. We're going to continue the series in Revelation. It's going to be a wonderful time. We are glad that you are here. Merry Christmas.
Christmas. Uh, you may all be seated except for the children. So if you're a kid, I'm going to ask you to stay standing right where you're at. You can stay kind of in front of your seat. And kids, I'm going to need your help with this portion of the Christmas service. My name is Zane and I'm one of the uh, student pastors here at Grace. And so kids, I got a couple questions for you. Uh, first, what does light do? You can answer out loud with words. It helps you see. I like that. Great answer. Uh, more, uh, what does light do? It shines. I love that. Okay, all right. Um, how about this? It helps us see in the dark, right? Yeah, helps you maybe not be afraid. How about this? Does anybody have a nightlight in their room? Yes, me, me too, you do. Brian Vaughn, that's awesome, I love that. He's a kid at heart, I knew it. Um, yeah, it shows us the truth of what's really there. It helps us to see the way we should go. And this story, which is the story of Christmas, is all about light. And so kids, I'm gonna need your help throughout this story, okay? So we got this giant light switch, and here's the deal, I can't push it on my own, so I'm gonna need your help and your strength, and what you're gonna do, I want you to push out your arms like this, and I want you to lean towards that switch, and I need you to really push, okay? So kids, hands out. Hands out, I, we got some adults helping. I love that, it's a team effort. Thank you, Andy. Okay, hands out, push, lean, 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 push. Wow, way to be. All right, so kids, stay standing, because I'm gonna need your help throughout the whole story, okay? Turning the lights on. But now that we got this first part going, let's dive right in. See, all the way back in the beginning, before there was anything, God created the whole universe. The very first words spoken in the Bible were from the voice of God saying, let there be light. And the Bible tells us that God saw the light was good, so he separated it from the darkness. He made the earth and then he made the the, the sun and the moon to reflect the light. And he filled the universe with billions of beautiful stars that light up the night sky. You see, everything was perfect. Okay, you ready for this switch? So kids, again, lean out, and adults too, if you would like. Lean out for those who are kids at heart. Push, 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 push. After creating light and the earth and the sun and the moon and the stars and the ocean and the plants and the animals, God made the very first people, Adam and Eve. And when he did that, he didn't just give them the kind of light that helps them see, he gave them his spiritual light of his goodness, his truth, his wisdom and his righteousness. And because of that, they were able to live in perfection with God. But it wasn't long before the darkness started to creep in on God's creation. You see, God had given them just one rule in order to live together with him in perfection. But Adam and Eve were invited by the serpent of evil to join in on the darkness and they broke God's rule. And even though the sun and the moon and the stars continued to give physical light, to the earth, the spiritual light of God given to the people went out. 
And with their sin, they plunged the whole world into spiritual darkness. But God has so much mercy. You see, he did not and he does not leave his people in that darkness. Are you ready to flip the switch? This one's a turn of dial, so you got to kind of like grab on, right? Grab it. There you go. That's good. Grab and turn the dial. Yes. In the Bible, the Old Testament shows that God is the God of the burning bush, that he is the pillar of fire that lit the way out of captivity, that he is the one who shines his face on, the pe- on his people when they were wandering in the wilderness. He even promised that one day his own brilliant light would outshine the sun forever and bring an end to the darkness. But how would he do it? Well, God told the people that one day a savior would be born who would be a light to them and he would save them from the darkness of sin. And the time had come. One night, a very special star appeared in the night sky, leading some shepherds by a nearby quiet place. Okay, this is a tricky one. Kids, I'm going to need you to take out your lights, the battery-operated ones. Adults, your time to light things on fire in church will come a little later. (laughs) Just be patient. Kids... You're going to take this. I don't light it yet just yet. Okay, okay. Here's what we're going to do. On the count of three, we're going to flip the switch and it's going to light this. Are you ready? One, two, hold it high. Three. The true light, Jesus, the King, the Son of God, he had finally come into the world in a way that was never imagined. The light of the world, Emmanuel, which means God with us, was living among human beings. Finally, the darkness was about to be very afraid. This little baby in a manger, when he grew up, Everything he did and said was like a warm beam of sunlight on dark soil. He brought God's truth and goodness and love, and he gave his own life for us on the cross. The day that Jesus was crucified, he died so that our sin could be forgiven. It was like the darkest and yet the brightest of days. Okay, this one we're going to slide, so kind of grab that slider and push it to the side. Push. Jesus, the light of the world, blinded the darkness with his sacrificial and generous love. He was buried in a dark tomb, but not even that could hold him. The brightness of his light was only magnified on the third day when he defeated death and walked out of that tomb. And because he did, we can now walk in the light of hope and joy and peace and truth if we simply believe in him. He gives us the power to walk away from the darkness. The Bible tells us that he transforms people of darkness into people of light, and he's inviting you. And that's why we celebrate Christmas. The night that Jesus was born was a message to the whole world that our Savior is here. In John 8, 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Okay, this last switch is a little tricky. Kids, it's a two-part switch. So at the count of three, you're going to turn your light off and sit down at the same time. It's a little tricky. That's why we're not having the adults do it. This is only for kids. You can handle it, all right? One, two, three, off, down. Well done. From a baby in a manger 
to a savior on a cross. Jesus is the only true light in this dark world. So follow him and you too will light up this world. And that's what the light of Christmas is all about. The first Noel, the angel did say, was to certain poor shepherds in fields as they lay in fields where.
Christmas is the most um, greatest day of the year. Gabriel came to Mary and said, you're gonna have a baby. And she was like, what? Mary was really scared of the angel too. And surprised that she was gonna give birth to a baby that is the son of God. Hey Joseph, I'm gonna have a baby soon. <laughs> All the hotels were full. And Mary was frustrated because I think the baby was the chicken and it took a long time to get to Bethlehem. And so they give birth to Jesus and lay him in a manger, which is like a food trough. 99. There was hate. Because that would, I think, warm him up. So did anybody else come to visit? No. Maybe? No. Three guys saw this star. So they got in their ponies and started um, getting their gifts to him. No, it wasn't their ponies, it was their camels. And they put Jesus in the baby carriage with lots of um, animals. And three men came and gave him three gifts. Silver, I think, frankincense, and gold. They brought a candle. A a candle, a crown, and a another candle. Another candle. But it was big. A bigger candle. Oh yeah, they bought candles. So multiple candles. Uh, like one small, one medium, one big. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, everybody. Well, thank you so much for joining us today here at EP, the Chapel Chaska and online, and a huge Merry Christmas to you. If you would, turn to the person next to you and welcome them here today and wish them a Merry Christmas. You know, one of my, uh, my favorite all-time hymns of Christmas is the hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Some say this hymn is over 1,200 years old, written in around the 8th or 9th century. Really, really an amazing, theologically astute song. I'm going to put the lyrics on the screen, just a couple of verses here. Just read them with me if you would. O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appear. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel, shall come to thee, O Israel. Next verse. So come, thou rod of Jesse, free, thine own from Satan's tyranny. From depths of hell thy people save, and give them victory o'er the grave. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel, shall come to thee, O Israel. I love that song. There are like eight verses to it, by the way. I love the, the history of it. I love the depth behind it. I love the theology. I love the anticipation and expectation of Emmanuel coming to save. And yet a lot of people sing that song or are familiar with that hymn, have no idea what the word Emmanuel means. So back in Isaiah 7:14, 7, 700 years before the birth of Christ, Isaiah said this, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold the virgin, shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Matthew 1.23 then quotes from Isaiah 7.14, echoing the same truth. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel is another name or a title for Jesus. It simply means God with us. Think about that, God with us, not apart from us, not separate from us, not against us, not coming to condemn us, God with us. You know, one of the things I've noticed is that that word with is a really significant word to people in Minnesota. We use the word with a lot. Can you, can you come with? And I'm like, can you finish the sentence? Come with or go with or stay with. Do you want to eat with? Do you want to ride with? And when I first arrived in Minnesota from Florida years ago, that used to offend 
my grammatical sensibilities, right? To end every sentence with a preposition. I used to think these are grammatical errors up with which I will not put, right? <laughs> but I am, I am now over it, right? And so Emmanuel means God with, right? Minnesotans, God with, God with us. God come alongside of us. Uh, Frederick Beekner said this, and I love this quote. I'm gonna put it on the screens. He said this, what we need to know, of course, is not just that God exists, not just that beyond the steely brightness of the stars, there's a cosmic intelligence of some kind that keeps the whole show going, but that there is a God right here in the thick of our day-by-day lives. As we move around down here, knee-deep in the fragrant muck and misery and marvel of the world. It's not objective proof of God's existence that we want, but the experience, here it is, but the experience of God's presence, that is the miracle that we are really after. That's the picture, right? That's what we're really after. And so knowing God exists is informational. It's a great truth to know, obviously. But knowing God is present is transformational. It changes the way that we think, the way that we live, and the way that we respond to life. Now, I love that the Bible doesn't just leave it with that, right? God with us. But the the Bible fuses truths together, right? And, And builds out the God with us promise. Over in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, it says this. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And so here's what Christmas is all about. God with us and the God that is with us then makes a promise to us that he would never leave us. Isn't that amazing? An amazing promise. And so the Hebrews writer highlights what God would never do to us, that God would never leave us, never divorce us, never betray us, never forsake us, abandon us, walk out on us. Now, contextually, right, you pull a verse out of context, you need to explain the context here. Contextually, the Hebrews writer is saying this, the secret to contentment isn't more. It isn't more money, it isn't more stuff. It's not more, it's more of the presence of Christ. Or it's actually us understanding, right, the presence of Christ more fully in our lives. And you know, sadly in life, some people leave. And maybe you've had that kind of a year where you've lost a spouse, a loved one. Maybe someone's divorced you or walked out on you. And and, and listen, I am so sorry if that has been your experience in this past year. But let me say this to you here this morning. Not Jesus. He doesn't divorce people. He doesn't cut out on people. He doesn't walk out on people. He never leaves. Think about that. Jesus Christ never leaves. No one else will ever make you that promise in life, by the way. No one else can ever say that, I'll never, ever leave, right? No one can say that but Jesus. And so here's the one thing that God will never do to you. He will never leave you alone. Isn't that great news? Like he will never leave you alone. And so so you aren't alone even when you're alone. So when you're in a battle, right, he won't leave you alone. When you're suffering, he won't desert you. When you're stinking it up in life, he doesn't cut out on you. And so Hebrews 13, five is basically God saying, I'll never, 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 ever, ever, ever leave you or betray you or turn my back on you. That God's presence is always present and he never leaves us or betrays us which is amazing news in this day and age. You know, today so many people, right, are plagued by like intense feelings of isolation and loneliness and alienation. And I think like the holidays only tend to kind of exacerbate those feelings that we have. Like I know that you can be in a room filled with people and feel alone and feel lonely. For example, according to recent studies, 25% of women, one in four women, deal with debilitating levels of loneliness. And it's even worse for men. 30% of men, nearly one in three men reported dealing and struggling with deep levels and ache, 
regarding loneliness. Even prior to COVID, a staggering 65% of those born between 1967 and 2000, 1997 and 2012 claimed that they have struggled with depressive levels of loneliness. Think about that. 25 and under, those 25 and under are struggling big time with loneliness. Some, some stats say, research suggests, that college students are actually the loneliest people on the face of the planet. And so when you feel weak, when you feel scared, when you feel alone or deserted, God wants you to know that he's, that he's with you. Of course he's with you. And here's what he would never do. He will never leave you. Look in verse six of chapter 13 there in Hebrews, so that we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? So Person, I think the key to being like centered in life, grounded in life, uh, courageous in a chaotic and dangerous world is knowing that God is with us, that God is our helper. And because God is our helper, that he's with us, that he'll never leave us, there's, there's no reason to fear anyone or anything in life. And then he asks the rhetorical question, what can man do to me? And the answer is a resounding nothing, right? Who's bigger than God? no one the last time that I checked. And so the larger point here is that God's presence can overcome your loneliness. God's presence can keep you from fearing man, what man says, what other people think or say. So I want you just to track the, the development of the idea here. God doesn't just exist. Oh, of course he exists. But God is also present with us through Christ, Emmanuel, and not only is Christ present with us, Christ is committed to us, deeply committed to us. He became one of us. And Christ then will never ever abandon us or desert us or leave us behind. And so theologically, we need to remember that as believers in Jesus Christ, we have been adopted into God's family. We've been adopted as God's children. And our adoption into the family of God is not temporary, it is eternal. And so many of you know my story, a bit of my story. I've never met my biological parents. And so when Pat and Holly Dobbs adopted me into the Dobbs family, it was, it was thankfully a permanent decision. So I wasn't a part-time son. I was their most valued, most loved, most favored and treasured and significant child ever. And by the way, I texted my brother and sister this morning and said, hey, I got a word for you in the sermon today. So Tony and Tracy, you know it's true. Thanks for tuning in, right? You know who mom and dad loved the most. The strange one of the family, right? The one who looks like no one else in the family. Well, listen, the same is true with Christ, right? Christ will never leave you or abandon you. And that's not just true now. It's not just true now, that's true forever. And so it's important that we continually like bolster our belief in Emmanuel, that God is with us and then that God will never leave us. Well, how do we know that? Well, God's track record is impeccable. I want you to think about this, just theologically, biblically, right? God has never not been faithful. God has never not been faithful to and present with people. So there's not one story in the Bible where God drops the ball where, where God goes MIA in someone's story from Adam and Eve to Abraham to Jacob to Isaac to Joseph and Mary to John to Paul to Timothy to me and to you. God's faithful presence extends from generation to generation to generation. And here's what the Bible says, that God never changes, that he is the same, right? Yesterday, today, and forever. His consistency in our lives is a guarantee. Uh, the second reason you can be sure that God will never leave you or abandon you is because God loves you, right? God loves you. I think it's, it's easy to forget that truth, that God loves us. And the truth is, is you don't abandon people that you love. You don't cut out on people that you care deeply for. You stay with them. You walk with them through life. And so why would God rescue us through the incarnation and crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ and then leave us or then desert us? The answer is that he wouldn't. 
His love keeps us. His love for us doesn't fluctuate based on how we're doing in life. He doesn't fall out of love with us. He doesn't come up short on his commitments. A third reason you can know that he'd never abandon you is that the Holy Spirit is inside of you. So the moment you place faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the Bible says that God put his seal on you and then deposited his spirit inside of you. 2 Corinthians 1.22 says this, and he who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Isn't that rich? Ephesians 1.13 says, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and you believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. And so Christ's presence is present inside of us. Our adoption in Christ is eternal and not temporary. The fourth reason that you can count on the fact that God will not abandon you is because God is currently prepping a place for you. How many of you know that? Like preparing a place for us, right? So if God left you or forgot you, why is he now preparing a place for you to live forever with him? John 14, two says this, in my father's house are many rooms. If it weren't true, would I have told you that it's true, that I go prepare a place for you? Obviously the answer to that question is no, right? And if I go and prep a place for you, I'll come again and I'll take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. So God is setting up the next life for us to live with him forever. And the fifth reason, right? You can be sure that God won't leave you or abandon you or betray you is because God cannot lie. You know, people ask me the question all the time, is there anything that God can't do? Yeah, he can't lie. That's one thing that God cannot do, he cannot lie. And so the, I think the most compelling thing that I can say to you is this, God always keeps his word. And so the question is, do you believe in the integrity of God's word? Do you rest in the integrity and the reliability and the dependability of God's word? And so listen, this morning, I wanna encourage you with this. Don't allow, don't allow the strength of your convictions to determine the intensity of your feelings or to be determined by the intensity of your feelings. We all know this is true. Sometimes we don't feel the presence of God. Sometimes we don't necessarily experience the presence of God. But that does not mean that God is not present. In the Christian life, we have got to start relying more on what God says than on what we feel. Amen? You gotta rely on what he says. And what he says is rock solid. It's foundational for life. Feelings are all right, but don't build your life on your feelings. Build your life on the reliability of his word. And so listen, the gift of Christmas is that God is with us, Emmanuel. And this God who is with us will never leave us. Never. In life, in death, he'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. You don't have to wonder about this relationship. It's the most rock solid relationship that you have. God's got us. God's not going to forget us and God is going to get us safely home. So let me, let me just share really quickly here three secrets that I've learned, maybe three realizations that I have made about the presence of God. Number one, realize that you, you never have to ask for God to be present. So when you're praying, you don't have to say, God, would you be with us today? Why don't you have to pray that? Because God already takes up residence in every square inch of the world. He's already everywhere present. You don't have to ask for God to be present. He's present. You don't have to ask God to be in charge. God be in charge of this situation. Already in charge of this situation. God, would you be the king over this? Already the king, right? So he reigns whether or not we acknowledge him or not. So you never have to ask God to be present. You just need to start enjoying and practicing and experiencing his presence. That's what we get a shift to how that we think 
about the presence of God. We've got to recognize it, not ask for it, all right? Because you already have it. Number two, and this will feel like a paradox to you. Realize that you have to, you have to get alone to recognize you're not alone. You have to get alone to recognize you're not alone. And when you, when you get alone with God, then and only then do you realize that you aren't alone, that you get to experience the fullness of his presence. So I wanna, I wanna encourage you, like I know things are chaotic. You gotta learn to get alone. And it's only in the quietness of your aloneness that you realize the richness of his presence. Amen? There's nothing else like it. And you gotta, you gotta learn to experience the fullness of his presence. And then finally realize that turning from sin and trusting in Jesus Christ is not a key, it's the only key. It's the only key to experiencing Christ in you and Christ living through you. The indwelling presence of Christ is a gift of salvation, but you have to trust in the person of Jesus Christ to access it. So I think a lot of us kind of believe, hey, you know, we're all God's children. We're not all God's children. God has created all of us. You only become a child of God when you trust in the Son of God and get adopted into the family of God. You gotta say yes to Jesus. And when you do, guess what? God puts his seal on you. Writes your name in the book of life. And then does what? Deposits his spirit in you. So that when he returns, he knows where the deposits have been made. Amen? And you can know him today. You can know him today. Amen. So Merry Christmas. God is with us through Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ will never, ever leave you. God, we thank you so much for the reality that you're with us and that you would never leave us. And no one else can make us a promise like that. So we rest in that today. I pray for, for people today, Lord, to say yes to Jesus, no to sin, and to experience the indwelling presence of Jesus Christ like never before today. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for never leaving us. Thank you for keeping your word to us, even when we don't keep our word to you. We rely on you and not our feelings today. And I pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Merry Christmas. Let's stand together.
You know, one of the things I love about the whole Christmas season is all the uh, rich symbolism everywhere, you know, like in the, in the decorations and things like that. I've discovered as I get older that I'm basically a, a Christmas nerd. Like, I love, I love Christmas. Uh, not ashamed, you know, give me the, the music and the movies, like that's all good. And I wanna know what things mean. So like, uh, any other nerds in the room that like research, like, wh like how, like where decorations kind of originated and all that stuff? <laughs> like, is there any fellow nerds, please? Now, I know there's like a bunch of like nefarious origin stories for stuff, you know? So like every now and then you get the Discovery Channel like has finally revealed the lost gospel of, you know, whatever. Like they take an hour to set up an argument that like even the worst scholar can dismantle in, in 30 seconds because we just love like the drama of secret knowledge. Now, of course, we want to be mindful that we're not engaging in anything wrong that doesn't actually adorn Christ. But with Christmas, I think we'd be remiss to ignore the beauty of tradition in church history. Um, you know, like with Christmas trees, right? For centuries, evergreens have signified eternal life. You know, stars and angels, of course, echo the Bethlehem story. Bells proclaim the joy over the news of Christ's birth. Candy canes, you know, shaped like a shepherd's staff, represents Jesus as the good shepherd. Uh, and the wreath actually symbolizes his unending love, his eternal kingdom. And something I learned this year is that it's also an echo of the crown of thorns, mm -hmm. right? Even the traditional Christmas colors that we see, like red symbolizes the blood of Christ, you know, his amazing sacrifice, and green represents new and eternal life. Gift giving mirrors the Magi's offerings to Jesus, and Christ himself uh, is a gift to the world from God the Father. And then there's candles. So candles embody the symbolism of Christ as the light of the world, dispelling the darkness paralleling the gospel's transformational message. So a church then, when we light these candles and sing, we, we become a choir of hope, like a beacon of light in this dark world, a symbol of sharing the radiant glow of the truth, inviting all to embrace the saving light of Jesus Christ. So as we always do on Christmas Eve, let us continue this rich symbolism by first of all, being careful. Okay, so like lit candles stay upright, right? While the unlit candle can angle and receive light. That way no wax gets on people's hands or in people's hair from the balconies above, right? Amen. Um, <laughs> but as light comes to you and your candle is lit, uh, share it with the person next to you and remember the wondrous glories of what took place 2,000 years ago on that silent Bethlehem night, okay? Let's sing. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, round yon virgin mother and child,
Lord, for he alone, and for he alone is worthy, and for he alone, for he alone is worthy. Let's lift our lights. And we'll give you all the glory. And we'll give you all the glory. We'll give you all the glory. May the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you. Merry Christmas. You may blow out your candles, drop them in the candle return on your way out, and we'll see you next Sunday. Drive safe, and again, Merry Christmas.